Welcome to part two of post-op nausea and vomiting management, where we are going to go over the 2020 consensus guidelines, and we're going to mainly focus on decreasing the patient's risk of post-op nausea and vomiting, and then reviewing all of the different medications or agents that we have to intervene for either prophylaxis or for rescue treatment. So come along with me as we work on decreasing our patient's risk for post-op nausea and vomiting. If you feel like this content is giving you value added to your practice, please subscribe and share and like, and I would love to hear your comments. Now, the guideline number two is reducing that risk. So the first thing that you can do is to minimize the use of opioids. And that is gonna be done with anesthesia, intra-op, that is gonna be done with the PACU nurse post-op. Multimodal interventions like the gram of Tylenol pre-op um, has a 1A recommendation. Uh, so 1A recommendation means that there is enough level of evidence out there through randomized control trials and meta-analysis of those randomized control trials to say that yes, is this is statistically significant in decreasing post-op nausea and vomiting. So if you see a level A1 recommendation, it means we should be doing this and then minimizing your post-op opioids. And if you're doing like IV Tylenol and multimodal interventions to decrease pain, then you will have a decreased need for opioids post-op. And remember those opioids trigger that CTZ zone to um, induce nausea. That's the pathway that it's blocking. The next thing we can do is avoid general anesthesia. That's a 2A recommendation. So um, ways to avoid general anesthesia is neuroaxial anesthesia, like an epidural or regional anesthesia, like a tap block, um, the transverse abdominal plane block for your large bellies. They've even talked about other types of blocks like thoracic blocks. Just remember that your blocks wonderful in minimizing post-op nausea and vomiting. So um, think about these uh, other anesthetic options than just going with straight general anesthesia, which now leads me into my next one, which is propofol. So, a total IV anesthesia, TIVA, in other words, a propofol-induced um, anesthesia and maintenance anesthesia, that has definitely shown decreased in post-op nausea and vomiting. And I think that you will find, just as I have found out there, that a lot of our anesthesiologists utilize propofol for almost every single surgical case. And, um, and so it does have antiemetic properties. It is an A1 recommendation. Nextly, we come to Sagamidex. So this is a reversal um, for your neuromuscular blockade. And it has been shown to minimize post-op nausea and vomiting over the use of neostigmine. So just um, consider that as uh, you are getting report from the anesthesiologist and just noting, did they get uh, Sagamidex or did they get neostigmine? Um, and then adequate hydration. There's been a lot of research around um, hydration so making sure that you begin those pre-op IV fluids to maintain euvolemia, and then again, resuming them post-operatively, that makes a world of a difference in rehydrating your patients and minimizing post-op nausea and vomiting. And that is a level A1 recommendation. And then avoiding nitrous oxide. So I think I've talked about that um, in my past presentations on general anesthesia, induction and maintenance. So nitrous oxide, it's an expanding gas and it can expand in your um, vestibular apparatus and triggering that nausea, another reason to avoid it. So any surgeries over 60 minutes, you should not be utilizing nitrous oxide for those surgeries. If you feel like this content is giving you value added, please like, please subscribe and please share. So guideline number three, if they have one or two risk factors, then they should have at least two multimodal prophylaxis agents. If they have um, greater than two risk factors, they should have at least three to four multimodal prophylaxis agents applied to their anesthesia plan. So here are our agents. And the very first one that's the most common is the 5-HT3 receptor antagonists, the serotonin blockers. They um, work on the CTZ zone and the GI tract. And our most common is Zofran or Ondansetron. So you will usually see four milligrams IV at the end of surgery. This is an A1 recommendation. I will share with you that literature out there has shown that a repeat second dose has found not to be effective. Um, in a, for a rescue emetic. And I have clinically found that as my experience, that if I go ahead and give that second round of Zofran, um, it really doesn't seem to do much of anything. 
It is more effective than Reglan, um, but it's less effective than Amend, which is an NK1 receptor blocker that we'll talk about. It's a new generation anti-anemetic. Uh, you do need to be aware of the wisoprin that it can prolong the QT interval. So just note that. The next thing that you're going to see for prophylaxis is your corticosteroids, which classically is dexamethasone. And it's recommended to give eight milligrams IV and it's given at induction. And that is a level A1 recommendation. Then next you will see your anticholinergics. On your anticholinergic group, you're going to see scopolamine patch on there. And for a scopolamine patch to be effective, it really should be applied the evening before surgery. Um, if you're giving it pre-op, it, it usually needs two hours to kick in to even have an effect. So if you're giving it post-op, you really have lost your efficacy window. So it should be given before the start of surgery. So onset two to four hours, it's an A1 recommendation. And just remember to instruct your patients that it can blur vision. So to not touch the patch, um, you put it behind the ear. And then because it is an anticholinergic, it can cause a dry mouth. Next are our antihistamines, our H1 antagonists, our histamine blockers. And most commonly we are familiar with um, Phenergan. We are also familiar with Dramamine. I have Dramamine under here because society made a recommendation for Dramamine. I haven't seen my anesthesiologist really order Dramamine um, in the, the PACU setting, but it does get an A1 recommendation, one milligram per kilo IV for um, Dramamine as a rescue agent. And then Phenergan promethazine, 6.25 milligrams IV diluted. It does have an FDA black box warning. It can cause um, gangrene if it infiltrates into tissue. It has a long half-life, 10 to 19 hours. So it'll get them through um, that first post-op day. And it does have a side effect of drowsiness. Research has shown that when Zofran fails, Phenergan is a good rescue emetic. So just wanted to share that with you. And in my clinical experience, I have absolutely found that to be true. Now, our next round, um, I'm gonna go over the NK1. This is the neurokinin-1 receptor antagonist. And this is gonna work on the CTZ zone, suppressing and delaying nausea and vomiting. And this is a new generation of anti-emetics. Amend, that's the pill form. So the IV form phosphoprepotent uh, is, comes in 150 milligrams IV, and it is more effective than Zofran, and that is an A1 recommendation. Amend comes in 40 and 80 milligram uh, pills, and it has a very, very long half-life, 40 hours. So this is for your patients who have lots of risk factors and, um, and then have a high risk for the post-discharge nausea and vomiting. This is a great agent to consider to have a conversation with your anesthesiologist. I have given this in um, when Reglan has failed, Zofran has failed, and Phenergan has failed. And this I have seen work. And I, I've been really impressed with this drug. Remember, amend phosphoprepotent. Nextly, we come to our dopamine 2 D3 receptor antagonists. And so we have droperidol or anapsine. Dose is greater than 25 milligrams. It's been uh, recommended to absolutely not give that because it can cause torsades and it has a black box warning on that. But low doses under one milligram, like the 0 0.625 milligrams, has been found over and over in uh, randomized control trials to be safe and effect A1 recommendation. Next, we have haloperidol, um, half a milligram IV. It has a 1A recommendation, but it is not FDA approved for, for nausea and vomiting. And then we have Reglan, 10 milligrams IV. This does have mixed evidence in the literature for efficacy, so I'll just share that with you. And then for phenazine, amitriptyline, five milligrams IV has an A1 recommendation. And then we also have our compazine, uh, the prochlorofarazine that I have found clinically to show um, improvement in nausea and vomiting. Did not have a recommendation on compazine. Uh, I'm not sure why not, but it is a common rescue antiemetic that I have seen across multi-institutions. Uh, anesthesiologists order it post-op in your phase one orders. So um, probably need to look into more about the efficacy of compazine, but I have seen it work. So, and it's gonna work on those dopamine uh, receptors, blocking them at the CTZ zone. I highly recommend that you do some additional reading on your own, even bring it unit practice committee groups 
for a, a unit project to review the guidelines and to um, see how you could apply it to your practice and join in with your anesthesiology group. It would be a great way to merge nursing and physicians together with a mutual goal of decreasing patient post-op nausea and vomiting. Inside the consensus guidelines, there are um, multiple medications that they recommend for prophylaxis and rescue therapy. And they also recommend dual um, pharmacological intervention. And I will let you go to that guideline and review it on your own. There are multiple drugs that are in there that are second generation 5-HT3 medications that we do not have approved here in the United States, but they are approved um, in Europe. And, um, and are used and have an A1 recommendation. And who knows, maybe further down the road, our FDA will be approving some of these new generation anti-nausea medications. Thank you for tuning in to PACU Nursing Minutes. I hope this gave you value added in your practice. If this did, like and subscribe, leave your comments. I'm Nurse Kathy, thank you.